Hey, here we are. Once again at my studio here on uh, in Brooklyn on uh, Union Street. And my friend Kelvin's there at holding the camera. And my friend Brian is here. Um, this is a, a base that was made at 168 Court Street in Brooklyn in 1978. I really don't know who the original owner is. I could find out, I guess, if I just go through all that junk I have laying around here. But um, it was on eBay a while ago, and uh, Marshall Hay, who is a, uh, actually he's a, a surgeon, a doctor in Toronto, um, uh, and he plays the bass, and he has a couple of my instruments. He bought this thing, and it was a total disaster. Somebody put another pickup in it. Somebody took my name off of it and put another name on it. This, the thing was just a mess. The pickups, the, the, the rings around here were destroyed. It was just, this is where the other pickup was. We put this in here, cleaned it up. I was going to send this to Marshall yesterday and I decided maybe I'll wait another day so I could do a little video on this and just talk to you about a few things on this bass that are different than some of the bases you see today. Um, this neck construction, I think we talked about this on another video, but I don't think I had a real base to demonstrate what it was. But just real short, and I know that some of this I've already said, but way back when I first started, I wasn't too good with the chisel and all, it wasn't too good making neck joints either. And I had a a bird's eye maple body that I was working on, and I couldn't get the I couldn't get it right because every time I took a chisel in, one of those little birds would pop out, and I'd get a little crack or something. I couldn't get the damn thing square, and it got to the point where I was really getting frustrated, and I think I ended up throwing the chisel on the floor and just getting really crazy, and. Uh, Ron Blake was there at the time, and, I, and Mike Parisi was there at the time. And I think I told Mike, I said, Mike, one of you guys, see if you can't get this damn thing squared away, because I can't do it. I'm losing my mind here. I mean, it was just, it was just every time I touched it, something else would happen. And I said, I said, what are you going to do, Carl? I said, well, I'm going to go down the street. I'm going to take my pad and pencil. I get down and get a, a nice glass of warm brandy, <laughs> and I'm going to draw some pictures, and I'm going to figure out a way to make a hole without making a hole, because there's got to be a way to make a nice clean neck joint without going through all this. You know? And I drew some funny pictures that I think Mike was a pretty good artist, and Mike cleaned up my lines and we took a look at it <coughs> and uh, I said, can we do this? What do you think, guys? And he said, yeah, let's, let's try it, see what happens. Um, I think I'll show you how that was done and then we'll get back to this actually base, to this base and show you the next joint, how nice and clean it is. Normally, when I made the first base, obviously this is not the first base. But when I made the first base, I made a pocket and I made a neck. Obviously this is a neck. And I put it in here, okay? Like that. And I drew it in. That's how those first bases were made. And I think I already said that's how the hill block came up too, because when I made that, I mean, the, the bird's eye thing, by that time, I did have a little bit of knowledge of how to use a chisel. It's just, I was working on a piece of wood that was giving me a lot of problems. 
But back when I made that first bass, I had no idea how to hold a chisel at all. I was just praying that I could get the damn thing in there. And luckily, I wasn't very good because, like I said many times, a lot of times, if you're a creative person, you think of ways to get around it. things that you really can't do. And I, I was having trouble getting the next joint in. And that's when I decided to put that little heel block on to cover up some of the mistakes that I was making. And I think I mentioned that too before. And uh, we have one of those bases. Where's, where's, where is that base? It's in the case. The one Here. I'm on in the is this it? No. This is it. This is, this is. The one oh, that's the, it, Brian's. The one with the first heel block? 74. Yeah, he's getting it. Oh, he, okay. He was on my bench. Yeah. Yeah, this one here. No, not that one. The one. Well, that one you can, yeah. That, 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 that was not the one I was talking about. This is this is the one I made. From, no, this, wait, this, well, this is great. This is Greg Makers, right? Yeah. Okay, this is it, yeah. Anyway, yeah, this. I made several like this. Actually, this bass just came in because Greg had some problems with the headstock, and we just fixed it for him. But, uh, the original hill block looked like this, and uh, I remember when Jimmy DiAcusto saw it, he gave me some ideas on how to correct, make it so it would be the way it is today. Um, over the years, almost everybody who makes an electric bass these days uses that hill block. Um, I never minded that, and I, it doesn't matter to me whether people know I came up with that first or last or whatever. What does bother me, people taking a lot of credit for things that they really didn't do. And there's going to be a video very soon. I'm not going to get into it now because I got, I, first of all, I got to get this base in FedEx so it gets up to, um, up to Marshall. Okay, that's cool. Um, I know I'm just talking here a lot, and I'm, I'm doing it, talking faster than I usually do because I got to get that base in a box and get it out of here. Um, anyway, that's the way I did it originally, and then I came up with the idea of this kind of construction, and that kind of construction was this. Now, mind you, these pieces of wood I'm showing you are not necessarily the woods that I would use. I just grabbed these out of the box back there. This is a neck that we might be using. I'm not sure what it is. But uh, we made the neck, put the block, the heel block on, and then we drew the board. We figured out where the neck was going to be in relation to the body, all that was figured out. And then you do this to that. That was the, okay? And then another piece of wood. Again, not necessarily this piece of wood. A piece of wood that was measured and fitted to the size of the neck and all that stuff, okay? And then this would be here. And it was glued onto there. And actually the first ones, there was no taper to this at all. We actually made the whole thing one long rectangle. There was no taper, no taper anywhere. It was just maybe a portion which ends up being like one and five eighths here to two and three eighths here. That rectangle might have been three inches wide, the whole thing. Maybe even four, because by the time you get down here, it gets a little wider. And then we figured, okay, this is this is the end of the neck here. It's going to be two and three eighths. So we measured two and three eighths. We got a center line here and a center line there, and here, and made it nice and line, and got all those dimensions correct. And then we drew another line parallel to that maybe an eighth of an inch out from that actual neck line. And the reason we did that was because 
we were going to be taking this whole thing through a bandsaw and cut the line all the way from here all the way to the end. So that eighth of an inch gave us a little play because sometimes the bandsaw you it'll travel and they just want to get the line reasonably in the right place. And if you cut exactly on the line and something happens, well, you're in trouble. And after that, then we run over the joiner and we get a nice clean edge. And then, by that time, we had a carved body, a scroll, and the other half I don't happen to have here. After this is all <clears throat> been squared up and glued on real nice and tight, then this is glued on to the body. And this one is that it? Oh, that's not this. Not the same body. I'm sorry. Um, it would be um, a similar life. Yeah, it would be a shape. Now this this was similar to that. You need one edge perfectly straight. And you, it's just, just assume, like I said, this body was for something else. And this was for another shape of a body. But anyway, just picture this fitting, okay? Because if I was going to do this body up to that piece of wood, I guarantee you this thing would fit perfectly in there. Um, and we put a board over here, uh, just a, what we call a clamping board, and you leave this part straight. So whenever this goes on, you clamp all this to it, and then the other piece goes on the other way. And it has a, another piece like this that's cut for that other shape. And that's all the real one. And the end result is, even when Mike Fabrizio, I remember Mike Sam, whenever I had those little sketches that I did over a glass of brandy, um, Mike said, you know what, Carl? This will work. And he says, not only that, he says, I think we're going to have probably the cleanest neck joint that you could imagine because we'll be able to clean up the glue. You won't be dancing around the scroll. You won't be doing this. You won't be doing that. You'll be able to clean up the glue perfectly. Um, and you won't have to worry about chiseling out any corners. There's no corners to chisel out. Everything is already there. Um, I remember when I, when, I, when, I, when I left that shop that day, and I, I, I said, I'm going to make a hole without making a hole. Mike's response was, what a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and when I came back, he really, he emphasized that. Mike was really something. Um, now the end result of all that jibber jabber I just went through would be this style of base. This is just picture this board here. That's this piece. This piece up here, this board here, that would be this piece. And it was all put together. If you look at the end, can you get a shot of that? You can see. Yeah. It can be yeah, pretty yeah, hard to see it. Light. Pretty hard to see the end. But this no. is that board down here, that, that back board. This is the top board. These stripes down here, they were added. You could do it with stripes. You could you could you could make a rainbow base. Do whatever you wanted to do. It wouldn't matter. That's it. Yes. Now, the end result of all that is this neck joint. This is like 1978. That neck joint you can see is super clean. No glue marks. No little frazzle. No little lines. No nothing. Everywhere. And even the front line, usually you get a little something in there. There's nothing. And Mike was right. He said, Carl, this is a beautiful design. Um, and it, you know, there, I remember Ken Smith 
whenever he wanted me to make his prototype for him. By the way, there's an issue with that, with that low life piece of crap. And he writes all that stuff in his magazines about how he carved the body and did all that work. He did no such thing. He bought some wood, he brought it in, he had a couple of cardboard cutouts that he wanted the body to look like this, and we did it. And um, he never carved any of that stuff. We did it all. Me, uh, Ron, and uh, Mike, my, my partner at that time, Joel, did most of the sanding on it. You know, that's uh, beside the point. Um, anyway, when we did that, we made his prototype with this kind of construction. So when he made his bases, he used this kind of construction. And I'm not sure when he and Vinnie Federo got together, but somewhere along the line, they were, and from what I gather, I don't know how true this is, but I just heard that, you know, uh, Vinnie, Vinnie had some kind of ideas that, that Ken came up with all this stuff. And it, uh, from what I understand, he believed it, you know. Well, that's just not so. And uh, I remember reading some things in uh, one of the books about some of these guys, including me. Uh, this kind of construction, they did this uh, uh, simulated neck through construction. I think something behind I don't remember exactly how they worded it. But the truth is, this kind of construction came about because I screwed up a neck joint and I couldn't get the damn thing right. And that's how it happened. And when I saw everybody else out there copying it, I just said, oh, I'm tired. I went back to my original ways of doing things, which I still do today. But this base came in, and we looked at it, and I kept looking at it. I, and I told Pete, and Joe, and Kelvin, these guys never really made it like this. So it would be like an experience for them to do that. Plus. Plus the fact is, I truly believe that it's probably the best way to put a neck on. You, know, you don't have to ever worry about drawing a center line. None of that. Nothing that none of that stuff ever comes into play. It will be centered. It, the, the, the neck is going to be centered on the block because it's all one piece. Uh, you know, and the reason I never wanted to make a, a neck through one piece all the way through was very simple. Well, first of all, I didn't like that idea. But if I made a, if I made a one piece construction, right, from here all the way down to the end of the body, how am I going to get my heel block in there? One piece. Yeah. Oh, I could have cut out and maybe fooled around and found a way to do it. But to run it this way, I didn't even have to hardly make any measurements at all. Which for me, <laughs> it was my way out not being a craftsman, not being luthier extraordinaire and all that other crap that these morons go through <laughs> calling themselves. Shame on you. <laughs> my dad would slap you silly. <laughs> Well, you're already silly, but he was sloppy anyway. <laughs> Carl, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. People talk about things like that and bring up words like tone and sustain. Do you have any thoughts on the matter, or did I you have any thought thoughts it. on that? I just never think it? about that. I wouldn't know. That, that's, that's, I think it's in the sound, and I always said, sound is an opinion. You know, it's like, you know, it's like wine, you know, I like this wine, somebody else likes this other wine. You can sit around and talk about it all day, why? You like this wine, drink that wine. I like this wine, this is what I'll drink. Simple as that. And when you're talking about sound, well this, you tap on a piece of wood and you say, if I make the bass out of this, it'll sound that way. Well that would be your opinion, somebody else taps on that wood, first of all, it's a different person tapping the wood, so it's going to get a different sound right away. 
You've got all those variables, but where does the neck go in relation to the body? Where does the bridge go in relation? Where does the, what kind of the angle do you have? All that stuff is pretty much, you know, um, there are different opinions about that too, but they wouldn't be as varied, that's for damn sure. And, you know, my, like, my total answer as far as I've said this a zillion times, if you want to get a good sound, first of all, you have to determine what you think a good sound is. And then sit your ass down and practice five or six hours a day. It seems like all the stuff I hear people talking about are switches and knobs and pedals and output and inputs and I've got a three-way switch and a ten-way switch and nine million knobs and everything else. No one ever talks about if you have a C chord, C, E, G, simple triad, and you lower the fifth a half step, you now have the color tones of a D ninth chord. You also have an F sharp minor 7 flat 5 chord. You also have an A minor 6 chord. No one ever talks like that. Why don't you want to learn that? You sit around playing the knobs all day. You could be learning something real where you wouldn't even need all those knobs. <laughs> you know, take the same C chord, raise the root a half step. What do you have now? You have an A seventh chord or a C sharp to release chord. All of that. That would be a much more benefit than sitting around trying to figure out, well, if I make the bass out of that, I'll be able to get more sustain. That's my answer right there. <laughs> Kelvin likes that. He likes it when I do that. <laughs> I have a friend who likes this one. Two. Double. Not get a double. <laughs> But it is, it's just all, you know, like I tell people, you know, if I was, <coughs> I've had a good life in this stuff, you know, and I say all the time, I never would, I would, if I knew today where I would be, if I knew then where I would be today, where I am today, I probably never would have done any of this. But at the same time, I got to meet a lot of nice people because of it, Kelvin, Pete. Joe, Brian, tons and tons of really nice people. And uh, it probably wouldn't have happened had I not made the bases. And I was fortunate enough because of this to actually help some people who were really in trouble. Some of the Make-A-Wish kids that I made instruments for. And this last young boy that came up from uh, Ohio, he didn't even want a bass. He just wanted to meet me. And what an honor that was, you know. Uh, all that stuff, very important, you know. In my life in the bass and the making world and the guitar world, as a musician, sure, man. That's why I say I can't worry too much about some of these people like Anthony Jackson and Ken Smiths and all the crap that they come up with. When I was just telling Brian, I think it was my 70th birthday, I was sitting over there and Joe and, 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 uh, and Pete were sitting here and my phone rang and I said hello and a voice on the other side said, hello Carl, happy birthday, this is Chuck Rainey. <laughs> you know, and Joe and Pete just about went through the room. Chuck Rainey calls you on your birthday. And it was such an honor, you know. I, of course I knew Chuck, and I, I worked with Chuck's instruments many times. Him and Jerry Jamal. I never had any problems with those guys. You know, they're just always just peaceful people. And, you know, there's only a few people that I had some real serious issues with. I'm going to talk about Ken Smith and and that article on the six-string bass in depth. Well, actually, I wouldn't say that. Not the article on the six-string bass. 
for the first six remains. What that article was, was an, an article on Mr. Jackson's blown up eagle. That's what that article was about. It wasn't about the description base at all. There was nothing in there about that. And I'm definitely going to do some detailed stuff on that. But not now. we got to get this base in the box, Calvin. Marshall's waiting for it. And we're good. I got another one of these coming through, did I tell you? No. Some guy, another base that's on eBay somewhere, uh, 77 or 78. 77, I think it was, with a broken headstock. Hmm. The headstock was completely off. Hmm. And, uh, and the guy called me and he bought it and he's going to send it to us. So we should be getting that sometime next week. Oh, cool. There'll be another one of these, you know. And maybe I can do a little video on that too as, as we, as we fi put the, fix the headstock, you know. I wish we would have taken some pictures of this thing when it first came in because it was really a mess. Anyway, this is going to my friend Marshall Hay up in Toronto. And Marshall's waiting for another base too, as a lot of people are. Hey, hang on one second. They're coming. They're coming. These are bases for who knows who. This a whole rack of necks back there, the stuff here, there's two in there, it's, it is happening. Like I know people wait a long time, and i said it a million times, I'm really sorry, that's just the way it is. I'm here sometimes until 10 o'clock at night, Kelvin comes in, Pete's here, Joe's here, we're all doing it. Nobody's sitting around watching out for Winfrey. We're all doing what we can do. Brian knows. Brian's been here many times when he's seen us and seen us all in action at the same time. Band saws going with the peach carved in the neck. I'm putting frets in or whatever. It just goes on every day, and it never stops. So it is just what it is. And uh, all I can tell you is. You will really get. I know somebody asked me once. They said, "Carl, I know I don't like to say this, but what happens if something happens to you?" I said, "What happens if something happens to me?" Pete will do it. Kelvin will be there. Joe will be there, and they have my permission to put my name on the headstock for you. I can guarantee that they will do the same thing that I would do, maybe even better. You know, be, these guys do not, they, 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 they will not shortchange anybody. You know, and that's, that's where that's at. So, you know, I, I said a thousand times, tomorrow, tomorrow is not a promise for any of us. So I can't guarantee that I'll be here tomorrow any more than I can guarantee that this piece of wood is absolutely perfect and that it's not going to warp or anything else. I will guarantee that if something does happen to it, I will take care of it. And if I'm not here, Kelvin, Pete, Joe, somebody will. Somebody with who's in my in, in, in my corner. You know, Kelvin's been with me a long time. I can't imagine Kelvin just well, Carl's not here, I'll just, it doesn't matter, I'll just make it. He's not going to do that. You know, that's not who he is. And that's not who Pete is. And, and Joe, young Joe, he's just, he's, what a nice young man, huh, Kelvin? Oh, yeah. He's been learned a lot of stuff since Joe, Joe came in here not knowing anything. You know, he just wanted to do it. Jeez, he's, he's come a long way now. And that's, that's the way it should be. It's just like my mother said, I said this a million times too. When I was very young, she took me aside and I always preface this with, I said this a million times too, I'm one of 11 children and I'm next to the youngest. And I, 
My brother was a good singer and a good artist, and some other messages were good dancers. My dad was certainly a good musician. There was a lot of talent and in the family. I'm the only one that ever went what they call professional. I actually made a life out of it. But I remember my mother took me aside and she said, Carl, your dad and I, we, we think that, you know, you seem to have some special gifts. And uh, let me tell you something. She says, the best gift that anybody can have is to share the gift. Without sharing, it's, it's nothing. She just said, you make sure, Carl, whatever you do, you share that gift. And I think she was also, I thought about this just recently. I thought we, Linda and I were talking about it. Besides telling me to share gifts, I think she was also letting me know, don't get full of yourself. You know, I had a feeling that she meant some of that because I was actually, I was 14 years old and I wasn't playing with big time musicians, but I was playing in the Dixie Man band with guys who were like 40, 45 years old. I was like 14. Now, I'm not bragging, you know, to say anything. It's just I was actually able to, you know, play with these guys. Uh, they weren't super professional musicians, but they were playing in Pittsburgh, and they were they were working musicians. They weren't they weren't uh, you know, monks, and they weren't Miles Davises, nothing like that. But they were good musicians, and they they took me in. And uh, I think my mother, she just kind of saw all that. You know, it's a good thing, of course, but I think she wanted to make sure that I never let that, you know get in the way of, of being a person. I, I, hopefully I, I've never done that. I've always had that respect for other people's and, uh, and their abilities. And uh, yeah, I think I'm talking too much. Anyway, let's put this bass in the case. Thank you. And uh, like I said, your bases are coming. I guarantee you, you're going to get them, and they're going to be great. This one's going out next. It's a guy from New Jersey. I can't remember his name right now. It's a nice six-string key. This is really, this is that wood from Oregon, hmm. Oregon walnut, with a guy named Dana. Pick that out for me. Okay, Kelvin. Yeah, I think we can close it. See you, bye.